Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing on Euston Road, NW1, one street west of the Camden Ripper's pickup place, two roads south of Paula Field's dismembered body parts, one street north of the sad faced killer's last sleep, and a short walk from the despicable deadbeat who drilled. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Situated at 137 to 139 Euston Road in King's Cross, currently stands the Travel Lodge. Like most chain hotels, the complimentary coffee in the rooms will undoubtedly be bad. It always is. Being cheapo crap, which tastes like it's been scraped off a baboon's backside. With a single serving of milk, so mean, I'd be better off suckling on a mouse's teat. And with just two biscuits, yes, two, either they don't want me to have a nice time, or they don't think I'm a man, but a chihuahua on hunger strike. Thankfully, back in 1945, on the ground floor, stood an all-night coffee stall which was owned by Fred White. A place where during the wartime blackout, servicemen and civilians could chow down on sandwiches with cups of hot coffee and tea. It was cheap, friendly and safe. Or at least it should have been. On Monday the 15th of January 1945, at 12.15am, a Dutch seaman called Jan Perveen was murdered at Fred White's coffee stall. It was a brutal and unprovoked attack which came out of nowhere. And yet it was both expected and unexpected, as the killer was already known to the police as the Creeper. My name is Michael. I'm your tour guide. And this is Murder Mile. Episode 247 The Creeper Most people are murdered by those they already know. Stranger attacks are rare. Killings without motive are even rarer. And although it does happen, it doesn't happen like this. Sunday the 14th of January 1945, King's Cross. After the D-Day landings, as the Allies swept across Europe, the German war machine spluttered to a halt and bombing raids were few and far between. Like most cities, London was no longer in a full blackout, but a dim out, meaning that unless an air raid sounded, lighting was permitted to the equivalent of moonlight. The night was dark, cold and cloudy, as a sprinkling of frost peppered the pavements. At the Osborne Hotel on Ensley Street, two Dutch merchant seamen on shore leave met for the very first time and headed out to grab a bite to eat and sink a few pints. They were Gerrit Bravenboer, a short but stocky sailor in his mid-twenties, and 27-year-old Jan Bernardus Perveen of Rotterdam. A six-foot-two-inch hulk with a barrel chest, ham-hock legs, no neck, no charm, no patience, and very little brains, whose tree-trunk-thick arms were crudely doodled with enough rude tattoos to make a docker blush. Normally, I would tell you about his life story, about the pain, misery, and heartbreak of his upbringing, so that you can sympathize with his plight and perhaps cry when his life is cruelly ended. But I won't. Jan was a violent drunken brute, a racist thug, and a bigoted moron, who picked fights with no reason, who wasn't liked, as you will see, and whose actions that night speak for themselves. And although in theory he was the victim, 
he had more to do with his own death than the man who would murder him. At 7pm, at the Rising Sun pub in King's Cross, Gerrit said that Jan had sunk at least eight pints of beer. As a big man with a cast iron liver who could hold his drink, he wasn't stumbling drunk, just loud and mouthy, having engaged in yet another pointless argument with the barman until last orders. Around midnight, back at the Osborne Hotel, Jan was noisy, Gerrit said. He started singing. Jan said he wanted some cigarettes and asked me to go with him as he didn't know the way. The nearest place selling ciggies was White's Coffee Store at 137 to 139 Euston Road, which was owned by Fred White. As a fast food store with space for a few standing customers, as Fred and Charles, the manager, cooked and served, perched at the bar were seven customers. Jan and Gerrit, Gerardus Nederpol of Antwerp, a fourth unidentified Dutch seaman, US Army Private Jeremiah Sullivan, a black GI named Private Herman Carter Robinson, and his paid-for date for the night, a white prostitute called Alice Emily Shepard. The mood was fine. Until Yen, who'd become pissed off that the stall didn't sell the brand of cigarettes that he wanted, got all pissy. As Gerrit recalled, I was standing back as I was fed up with him grumbling. And as this minor inconvenience had truly knocked him, Fred said he was mad drunk and looking for trouble. At 12.15 a.m., in what Gerrit recalled as, for no reason, having never seen each other before, Gerrit barked at Herman. You black bastard. You wouldn't be with a white girl in the States. I've been over there, and I know what they would do to you, you Mexican bastard. As Gerrit tried to quieten him. Being wary of this brute's aggression, as Jan spat, you Mexican nigger. Herman rightfully said, Hey, watch that stuff, meaning his bad language. But as Jan's racist blood boiled even hotter, having pushed the black GI to goad him to fight, as Gerrit held Jan back, Alice and Herman saw their chance to leave and took it. Herman and Alice were walking away, heading back to the Liberty Club, a hostel for black servicemen. And as far as they were concerned, the argument was over. They had only made it 25 feet west. But as they passed the coffin makers and the front entrance of the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital, having broken free, Yan screamed, I'll break your bloody neck, as he dived right on top of Herman. The fuming Dutchman repeatedly punched Herman in the face and slammed his head into the pavement. As the two men tumbled into the road, risking being run over as cars swerved to avoid them. And although Fred had tried to split them up, again Jan broke free and grabbed Herman by the throat, screaming, I'll kill you, you black bastard. I'll fucking kill you. As all racists are thick as pig shit. As the two scuffled and Alice screamed, Fred later stated, I parted them again. The colored soldier went away with the woman and I stood with the Dutchman until they were out of sight. All the time they were going up the road, he was shouting, I'll kill you, you black bastard. He was raving mad. With the Liberty Club so close, Having said goodbye to Alice, Herman was safely behind a locked door within minutes. So by the time that Gerrit and Fred had released the seething sailor, he'd vanished for good. 
and yet, barely seconds later, Yan would be dead. His killer was a total stranger to him, who was known as the Creeper. The Creeper was an enigma, and what little we know about him is sketchy at best. Born in 1907, supposedly in Lagos, Nigeria in West Africa, unremarkably, the Creeper's real name was Philip Berry. Being short and stockily built, in a scruffy brown suit and a trilby hat, Burdened by a moon-shaped face, the thin black moustache on his top lip looked like a slug had humped his nose. And with his glasses so thick, they looked as wide as cracked saucers. Although an odd little man, always wearing crepe-soled brothel creepers on his feet, he walked with a skulking gait, as if he was always up to something bad. His nickname amongst the prostitutes was Jesus. As apparently, mid-coitus, he was prone to quoting scripture from the Bible. And although strange, it wasn't the only thing about Philip Berry which was. For 20 years, Berry had been a boilerman stoking the fires which fueled the engines of cargo ships, like the SS Honomu. It was a dark and grueling job for little pay. But all that changed on the 5th of July 1942, when the 7,000 ton beast was torpedoed by a German U boat and sunk in the Bering Sea of Finland. Of the 41 crew, 13 died, and although 28 survived, after two weeks adrift in a frozen lifeboat, with no food, no fire, and no shelter, many were badly injured with the fingers of Berry's left hand falling off owing to frostbite. Rescued by a British crew, Berry moved to London, got a job as a boilerman in the bowels of the war office in Whitehall, and although he lived in cheap lodgings across the city, he rarely slept there. Instead he chose to snooze outside in the air, on a chair by a fire in a club, as if he was back on board his ship, or often spending his nights prowling the street, the creeper had a reputation as a weirdo. By day he walked, by night he stalked, as his soft shoes silently creaked along the red light districts of Soho, Paddington and King's Cross looking for whatever love he could find, for at most a pound a time. In October 1942, at a pub in Soho, he met 31-year-old Mary Miller of Scotland, a dance hostess and prostitute. And although he said he loved her, she'd state, we met from time to time by appointment. As a widow, from an unhappy marriage, with three children, all of whom were dead. Mary's life was hard, and made harder, as her dead husband had no savings or pension, so she had no choice but to sell sex. In January 1943, Berry moved in with Mary. Only this wasn't a relationship which was built on love, but fear as being a nasty piece of shit. Her face was often bruised, her body was often battered, as many times he would strangle her. Being possessive and jealous of her having sex with other men, which was odd given that he lived off her earnings as a prostitute. As an abusive bully who regularly carried one of two revolvers in his pockets, at least twice as we know of, the police were called to their flat, as he had threatened to kill her. In 
in August 1943. As Mary sat on the windowsill, cleaning the windows of her flat on Cambridge Road in Kilburn, he caught hold of my legs, Mary said, and tried to push me backwards out of the window. I kicked him so hard he let go. But as he pushed me, he shouted, You look fine on the other side. Meaning dead. On Saturday the 19th of February 1944, in her second floor flat at 20 Torriano Avenue in Kentish Town, having grabbed Mary by the throat and pinned her to the bed, before he could hurt her further, her lodger and the client wrenched him free, and insisting he leave, she tossed his suitcase out of the front door. That day, Mary complained to the police. But they did nothing, as being a prostitute, it was said she brought it on herself. Her life was worth nothing. And although Philip Berry was a criminal who was known to the police as the Creeper, they would do nothing to protect her until he turned to murder. On Tuesday the 22nd of February 1944, two days later, Berry returned. Entering what he saw as his flat, which he'd been booted out of, to collect his suitcase, which wasn't there, only to find his woman in bed with another man, a cowardly client who would flee in terror with his trousers round his ankles. Ten-year-old Joseph Yule's a neighbour, said that he heard a man knocking a woman about in that house. As he rained down fists upon Mary's screaming and steadily swelling face, neighbours said they heard the rear window open. Why is uncertain. Maybe she was trying to call for help, or maybe it was her only means of escape. But with two nine-year-old twins, the Richardson boys, clearly stating, the black man pushed Mrs. Miller out of the window. He pushed her in the small of her back. With the entire street alerted to her panic screams, I saw her hanging out of the window. She fell downwards and screamed all the time. Falling 20 feet onto the hard concrete of the basement steps below. She landed head first. With the police and an ambulance arriving just a few minutes later, Dr. Sidney Tibbles stated she was found in a crumpled heap wearing just her pajamas. Bleeding from a severe skull fracture and coughing up blood, as she drifted in and out of consciousness, she was rushed to St. Mary's Hospital in Islington. Listed as critical, with her left eye ruptured and protruding, blood in her spinal fluid, and her brain swollen. Mary fell into a coma, and although she was described as a death's door, miraculously she survived. Callously describing her as not my wife, just a girl. In several statements Berry made to Police Inspector MacDonald, all of which were inconsistent, on the 18th of May 1944, he was tried at the Old Bailey. Discharged from hospital a day later, Mary was too sick to give evidence, and owing to her head injury, she couldn't recall what had happened that day. And although it should have been a clear case of attempted murder, with much of the evidence based on what the witnesses had seen, it wasn't to be. With the defense describing Mary as a woman who preyed on colored men when they have money to spend, and even the judge sympathizing with him by stating, it was a great pity he had anything to do with her. 
bafflingly finding no intent to his crime. On the 22nd of May, the charge was reduced from attempted murder to grievous bodily harm, and Philip Berry was sentenced to just nine months. Sent to Brixton Prison, he served just six and was out by November. Mary was left a broken woman who walked with a limp, suffered from epilepsy, sickness, headaches and dizziness, and barely able to work legally, let alone illegally. She struggled to get by on benefits. Mary was a violent man who was selfish and sinister. And although she still bore the physical scars and the emotional wounds he had inflicted upon her, on Boxing Day, at a Chinese cafe in New Compton Street in Soho, he stalked her for the third time that month and pestered this weak woman for money. We argued, Mary said, and suffering a fainting spell. As I fell against him, I struck my head on a hard object under his coat. A 45 caliber revolver. As an evil unrepentant beast. Although she was hardly half the woman she once was. Unable to give him a single penny. He spat. I failed the first time. But I won't fail a second time. That day. On New Compton Street. Philip Berry tried to shoot Mary Miller dead. But thankfully, having been ushered to safety by a friend, that's the last time I saw him. Mary Miller would survive her violent relationship with Philip Berry. And although they had never met, death was looming for a Dutch sailor called Jan. Sunday the 14th of January 1945. After a grueling shift, shoveling coal into the boilers in the fiery bowels of the war office, even though he lived in a small lodging at 8 Mornington Crescent in Camden, Barry had a quick snooze at the Coloured Colonial Social Club at 5 Gerald Street, and then he hit the dark-lit streets. His eyes white, his fingers gnarled, and his shoes shuffling stealthily, as in his pocket lay a 45 caliber revolver. And although the ladies of the night all knew him, they wisely crossed the street to avoid the creeper. At 12.15am, outside of White's coffee stall on Euston Road, the hulking lump of Yan hurled Herman's stick-thin frame to the ground. Punching, kicking, and slamming his head into the road as car swerved. Scuffling, as Alice screamed, Fred pulled the two men apart. As aided by Garrett, he held back the red-faced, seething moron who frothed with rabid racism. Spitting, I'll kill you, you black bastard. I'll fucking kill you. As Alice, the sex worker, led Herman, the black GI, round the corner until he was out of sight. The fight was over. Herman was gone. And Jan's temper was cooling. Herman later said, the woman walked with me as far as Upper Woburn Place, where she said goodnight, and I went into the Liberty Club. It was his first day in London. He didn't know anyone at the coffee stall. Not Fred, not Alice, and especially not Yan. And like most people, he saw nothing, and he heard nothing. But out of the darkness... The creeper crept like the wind. 
Fred said, The next thing I recall is that a small colored man ran into me, knocking me off my balance, saying, Get out of my way. By then, Bing stood in front of her coffin makers as he venomously glared into the inky blackness amongst the dim out, into where Herman had vanished to. The last thing that Yan supposedly heard wasn't Barry's brothel creepers, but him shouting, You couldn't kill me, buddy. Barry didn't know him. They'd never met. And what he saw of the incident before is uncertain. From his right pocket, Barry pulled the revolver. And although the looming shadow of the giant pasty racist swamped the little black dot, although easily a foot taller and twice his weight, the Dutch seaman was no match for four hard fast slugs from a 45. And fired from just two feet away, Jan fell like a sack of shit. The first bullet ripped open his right wrist as he covered his eyes. The second burrowed deep into his chest, which severed his left lung, his aorta, and ricocheted off his spine. The third smashed his left shoulder, and shattering it to pieces, they exited his body like shotgun pellets. And the fourth dislocated his left elbow. Slump into the ground, Yan could do nothing but dribble and bleat. His pale face on the frosty floor, as blood and various fluids oozed from every orifice, whether new wounds or old holes. Having been shot directly outside of the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital on Euston Road, the big bearded brute was carried inside and examined by Dr. Dixon, but with his beer-filled chest swimming in blood and what was supposedly his heart bleeding out. Jan Bervin was pronounced dead on arrival. As you might expect, the investigation was short. Very short. Eight people at the coffee store described him as a small black man with a slug-like tash thick lens glasses, a brown trilby hat, a dirty suit, and a deformed left hand. And with Alice Shepard, Herman's brief date and a King's Cross sex worker, stating, I heard the shots. He ran past me by the fire station. I knew this man as Jesus. Inspector John Black easily identified the suspect as the creeper. At 12.40am, Berry returned to the coloured colonial social club to sleep by the fire. And just 11 hours after the shooting, Berry was arrested in room 0047 of the war office, shoveling coal into a boiler. When questioned, Berry said, I don't wish to make a statement. I'm in enough trouble. So why he did it? remains a mystery. Tried at the Old Bailey on the 12th of March 1945 before Mr Justice McNaughton pleading guilty to willful murder. After a three-day trial, the jury retired for just one hour before returning with a guilty verdict. Donning his black cap, Justice McNaughton decreed that the right sentence was a death sentence. And although manslaughter was not considered as there was no hint of provocation, later commuted to life in prison, once again, Philip Berry would serve a pitiful sentence and was released after just 10 years. Oddly, in November 1945, just eight months after his trial, having been reduced to theft 
having stolen a pendant and a book of clothing coupons from a neighbor on Torriano Avenue. And deceit, owing to the horrific injuries inflicted by her ex-boyfriend, Philip Berry. Mary Miller was tried at the Old Bailey. As a widow, Mary had struggled to scrape by. Later learning that her husband was in debt, but he had in fact abandoned her. With him also having bigamously married her, Mary was charged with falsely declaring the army pension of a serving soldier, and she was sentenced to six months in Holloway Prison. Here in the news, owing to her weakened heart, she collapsed. Carried to her cell by two warders, an uncompassionate judge declared, You are obviously in need of medical attention, and you will get the best of that in a place of detention. 33-year-old Mary Miller, who still had the scars of the attack on her broken skull, would serve more time in prison for bigamy than Berry did for her attempted murder. race to get that done oh welcome to extra mile unscripted this unscripted unedited a bit there we go oh, it's a bit of a race against that one to get that recorded the rains are coming in and in the in the back i'm going to take your little hat off sorry uh in the background was a little as a duck one of those rapey little ducks that are out there the mallards and mouthy little bastard was he did that for 10 minutes solid and I can I can hear him he's down on my left he's probably about 300 feet away and I can hear him getting nearer and nearer and I was thinking oh you little bastard you little bastard stay over there don't want you turning up and mouthing off in front ruining the atmos so uh there we go there we go folks so I uh, hope you enjoyed that one that was another one that I I found in the archives didn't know that much about it uh to be honest the file itself wasn't that interesting i i i found out about the creeper whilst researching the soho strangler if i remember correctly i think yeah i think i was about right uh i i think i, I was researching the final murder of the camden ripper because it because uh where the final uh lady was murdered it's it's literally it's 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 not too far away it's literally not too far away so i i stumbled across this one and then in the papers they were referring to him as the creeper and i, th I thought to myself yeah i'm gonna i'm definitely gonna do that case s at some point and i pulled the file out the, out the archives and it was all right it was just i was expecting a lot more from the creeper but when when i started researching uh the attack on mary miller that became that that really kind of made it for me that really made it quite exciting so uh yeah uh, i'd love to know more about the creeper um unfortunately there's not much out there and, and given the fact that he was an american he probably went back to america and given the fact that his name is F potentially philip berry is the name he goes under but, and you know it's not exactly a unique name not like uh jan ben bernardus whatever his bloody name was hugen flugen schmugen yeah, schmugen whatever it is so uh yeah um uh philip berry will be hard to track down i mean even though physically he's easy to track down he'll be hard to track down but there we go there we go what what's going on in the world i don't think i'm gonna make a cup of tea because i'm it's what time is it 11 20 i've I, I wrote this one really this was really i felt i really enjoyed writing this one so it was really easy to write therefore i'm ahead of the game therefore i'll go to the other coffee shop today and i'll sit and i'll have my decaf soy latte and then i'll have a diet coke and then i'll regret it because because i'm an old man now i can't have diet coke because it makes me wee a lot it makes me wee really fast so uh yeah it's it's a it's a, it's a bladder irritant and i shouldn't really have it but i do like a diet coke i might have to suck it up and not suck it up i might have to suck it up and have a de caffeine free diet coke which tastes like shit uh anyway what else is going on my, I, I removed the uh bandages off my back yesterday 
uh, having blist badly blistered i got burn blisters up my back oh they're horrible they were big big old burn blisters so i took i took it obviously um uh the the nurses said uh it should you know, after 10 days it should be fine i'd had three lots of um uh, uh bandages put on courtesy of the nhs all for free thank you very much nhs oh it's nice having an nhs isn't it all free you don't have to pay for anything you just you pay your taxes and it's all done for you and you walk in when you need to oh what a great way to live sorry americans uh <laughs> very nice great service walked in really really i had the same 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 lady the second time second and third time she was very good very helpful and she she looked at it and she said yeah that's fine uh give it another 10 days and i was like it's starting to itch and she was like oh, that's good itching means uh it's it's drying out but it also means that it's starting to heal so i checked it the other day and it felt really good which is very good uh what's going on else uh, today is payday today i get I, I get paid my money my money from uh, acast which i consider payday which is good uh i'm going to buy myself some new boots because i need some new boots can i need a new waterproof jacket because that's bust again uh and also that this this is how boring i am the highlight of my day do you know what the highlight of my payday is my, my money my money comes in sorry I, I got a mate who's uh who's never worked in his life and he always refers to my money his his benefits as my money it's just a, he's he's not sick he's just he's just really fucking lazy he's, he, he doesn't want to work he's always got excuses so uh he he always goes oh i'll come out when i get my money so I always make reference to my money. Uh, this is my money because I fucking work for it. Um, when my money comes in, uh, I always put a big chunk of it in my ISA. It's the first I've always done that for years. I always have loads of savings because I'm. You know, when you've been poor, you never want to be poor, so you always stockpiling money, and that's the first thing I do. And that's what I'm waiting for is my my money to come in, uh, and then I can put it in my ISA which is very exciting that's the that literally is what i do i put in money into my isa and then i go oh let's let's top it up to that amount and then i go oh, maybe a bit more that's the highlight of my day oh great what else is going on it was my niece's birthday the other day that's very exciting uh because two of my nephews remembered and two nephews forgot and my niece forgot and because it's her birthday just gone uh i sent her the cheapest card i could find it was 10p it said it said on the front uh uh favorite nephew uh inside i wrote well you didn't bother to wish me a happy birthday not even a card not even a, not even not even a th happy birthday un uncle donkey as i'm known uh not even that so I, I sent her a really shit card with because you couldn't be asked to thank uh say uh happy birthday to me and inside i put a coin and it was a, fre a 25 french centime coin which for her will be of no use at all and it was, it was very, and then i put a, a second class stamp on it which meant it would arrive late <laughs> it's very funny i got a message from her the next day going uh, uncle donkey thank you uh thank you very much for my card and my coin inverted commas uh sorry i didn't say happy birthday to you which is important i think you should do that i think if people forget your birthday and their family you should you should make it clear to them you know i never forget their birthdays i never forget anniversaries anyone who has an anniversary i always remember that because it's in my phone and i always make sure i send them a card or if even if i do forget i always i always message them and say happy birthday um i'm going to thank uh patreon supporters see i'm remembering to do things why because i write stuff down good boy uh thank you to patreon supporters uh victoria blewett andrea aka wpc stubbs and grand mimi so thank you victoria blewett thank you andrea aka wpc stubbs and grand mimi i wonder if you if you are a real wpc or, or whether you're just using that to try and get close to police constable arsenal guinness or a metropolitan plot i wonder if you know police constable arsenal guinness there we go that could be quite exciting um just to say uh, i hope everyone if you are a patron subscriber don't forget everyone who's a patron subscriber gets access to bad nanometers which is goes out every thursday uh i add in stuff that's just i read out in full things that will kind of appear in uh uh in the research that may be interesting to you i find them interesting so it's kind of it gives you a rather than a half an hour episode where we're kind of adding little details this is like if it's a full five page statement we will read the full well not we i will read it you don't read it because i'm you can't see it 
but I can see it, therefore I read it. And sometimes badly, but uh, therefore I read it. And, it, you know, it's just interesting stuff. So uh, if you like Murder Mile and you like all the extra research and stuff like that, join in. There's loads, loads of extra stuff. I don't was it was it uh mikey the other day very kindly said uh that the uh, uh the patreon uh content is is exceptional I, I don't remember if you used the word exceptional i'm going to use the word exceptional it, you didn't use the word great or good but it was it was a good word it was a big word i remember that but i can't remember what the word was i think it was inc- it could have been incredible it could have been magnificent uh, let's say magnificently incredible there we go um so let's do some quiz questions and then we'll dive into some extra stuff uh for uh what uh, not what's this it's not war with me what am i doing oh, my brain is gone this is extra mile i've got too many things happening my brain is just fried right 10 questions don't forget i haven't edited the episode yet so i might balls them up so let's do this uh question number one london was in a blackout but what uh sorry london wasn't in a blackout at the time of the murder but what was it in Question number two, what hotel was Gerrit staying at? Question number three, what jobs did Jan and Gerrit do? Oh, no, I need a wee now. I haven't even had a Diet Coke. Question number four, what pub did they go to first? Question number five, how, how many pints do we know that Jan drank? Question number six, what did Alice and Herman have at the coffee stall? Question number seven, Herman was staying at what hotel slash club? Question number eight, in what city was Philip Berry born? Question number nine, uh, his nickname amongst the prostitutes was what? And question number ten, why? I.e. why to question number nine. Not, not why, that's a bigger question, that's a huge question. Um, so let's dive into some extra stuff. Uh, this location doesn't exist anymore. It got demolished many, 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 many years ago. It was owned by Frederick White of Seven Sisters Road. It was on the corner of Euston Road. And uh, just up from here uh, is uh, a, 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 an airline called Eva Air. Oh, what a wonderful airline that must be. If I, all, all the air stewardesses and the, and the pilots look like Eva. <sighs> I travel everywhere. Um, so the victim, I, inverted commas victim, because I think we can agree he's not, even though he was killed, I, I wouldn't really call him a victim. I'd call him a twat. Uh, his name was uh, Jan Bernardus Perveen. He was a Dutch seaman, heavily built, six foot two inches tall. Uh, at that time, he was living in a seaman's home, Ua, in the East End. We don't quite know where. He'd uh, apparently they were both on shore leave and he had a tendency to get very drunk and very violent uh quite racist born on the 26th of august 1917 in rotterdam um the woman the woman the woman uh alice emily shepherd of 13 affleck street n1 so that's kind of uh just north london slightly is uh, i think that is king's cross i think affleck street is um her street name was callie she was a housewife. Uh, at the time of all this, her husband was in the Pioneer Corps in Belgium. Uh, the man, uh, Herman Carter Robinson, uh, private first class. of uh, He was uh, in the quartermaster service uh, of the US forces. And they currently at that point were based in Taunton. So that's Somerset. Somerset. Uh, he was staying at the Liberty Club, which, as mentioned, was a uh, a club specifically for for uh, black servicemen. Uh, what else we got? The fight. Let's dive into some details about that. Uh, what do I want to tell you about this? Uh, it, it was I, I kind of simplified it slightly because it was it was slightly annoying. It was kind of uh, Jan punched Philip in the face as he turned around, knocked him into the road uh, into the roadway. Jan dived on top of him. They were both fighting. Uh, Jan was banging Philip's head on the ground. Uh, it's really weird. There's so much anger here, and he doesn't even know him. But I, I think it is just he saw a black man with a white woman, and he got angry because he's a massive racist. Um, sometimes that's all it takes with people who don't have a lot of brains don't have a lot of brains and also like to blame other people for the failings in their life let's be honest that's the problem with most things in life isn't it that people blame 
other people for things because their life is shit and therefore they have to find a fault and instead of turning to themselves and going i'm the cocksucker here i'm the shit bag i fucked up my life they go no no it's that person because of their skin color or because they're from a certain country or you know utter utter wankers out there really are really are some shit bags in the world people who need to wake the fuck up look in the mirror and go oh it's me i'm the problem with with my life not everyone else utter utter wankheads oh anyway um yan knocked philip to the ground as mentioned uh, mr white so that's fred uh, intervened and separated them both it's fred's statements are really dubious and we'll get into that in a bit uh, i'm not saying that fred is a liar i'm just saying that when the police turned up he might have heightened things a little bit to make him sound more heroic um uh yan grabbed philip by the throat and they were fighting in uh in the uh in the road um Fred said, uh, when I went back to the stall, the Dutchman ran up to the road after the coloured soldier and knocked him down again. That was about 25 yards west. I heard the girl screaming and the others at my stall said they said he had got him on the ground. I left the stall again and parted them. The coloured soldier went away with the woman and I stood with the Dutchman until they were out of sight. All the time they were going up the road, the Dutchman was shouting, I'll kill you, black bastard, I'll kill you. Um... He said he held the Dutchman against the wall, describing the Dutchman as raving mad. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, Mary Miller, uh, whose story uh, we learned about in here. So she, uh, at the time she met Philip Berry, she was 31, 33, when she finally got rid of that piece of shit. She was a dance hostess. Her real name was Mary Baird read she was born in scotland on the 4th of march 1913 uh, so even though the newspaper said she was 23 years old she wasn't she was 33 well done newspapers all you've got to do is do simple maths uh, she was married in 1935 to a william hanks uh, she lived with him until war broke out uh, and he was serving overseas they had three children but all of them died uh, prematurely uh, unhappy marriage uh yeah she was separated slash possibly divorced from him and payments were coming in from him but then they kind of stopped in around 1941 uh, and she'd been told that her husband had been killed in action although she had no proof of this but let's not forget it's wartime so there's a lot of a lot of people disappearing a lot of people being killed a lot of bodies not being able to be proved people going missing uh and if you're um uh, a prisoner of war do you know that you know you can still be reported missing or dead even though um no one knows where you are uh, uh he uh hang on i'm just going back on this uh so that was her original husband and then she met a man called robert ha robert miller who was a corporal uh that was around 1941 apparently they married at greenwich town hall and he was a serving sergeant in the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. Um, so that's where we kind of get the idea at the end that she is um, she's married, but she's bigamous married because she was told that her former husband was dead, but apparently he wasn't dead. Um, uh, she had some criminal convictions, but nothing major. Uh, 1929 in Edinburgh, Mary B. Reed uh, was uh, convicted of theft and uh, charge. Uh, uh, she stole 10 shillings uh march 1914 older shot so this is clearly when she's with uh she's clearly there to be near the barracks so that must be where her husband was uh, she was fined two pounds for receiving four and a half pounds of beef uh november 1944 in clerkenwell she was fined for receiving bad linen uh, seven sheets and four pillowcases valued at four pounds and 5th of February 1945 in Southampton, she did one month's hard labour for trespassing on government land. Uh, it doesn't really say much about it there at the moment. Um, um, in the report, it said she had no convictions for soliciting or prostitution, uh, even though the police file states there is no doubt this woman is just a common prostitute. She has no respect for her at all. It's just they really don't. Um philip um he had an alibi that night but it's not a very good alibi uh so he didn't put that in because it kind of throws it off but uh joseph bracco and philip uh, sorry and daniel john two 
black men of Harrington Square. Don't forget this is the 1940s, so you know if it's a if it's a black man, they go the black man because it's it's exciting. Oh, a black man! Wow, God. For some people, it would it could be the first kind of black person they see. Therefore, that's kind of the 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 thing where they go, oh wow. Um, uh, they were at the Coloured Colonial Social Club at Five Gerard Street. Gerard Street is now what we would regard as uh, Chinatown, just south of Soho. Uh, they were there all night uh, on the fourteenth, so that's a Sunday, playing billiards. Um, they said roughly around midnight, Berry walked in and wanted to join the game. Uh, he was still in the club at 4.30 in the morning the following morning when he left. Edward Thomas, the night porter at the club, said he admitted Barry at 11.55pm and Barry remained there until the tubes opened in the morning. So that was about 6am. Uh, that apparently was his alibi and there were only three people in the club to prove it. Although, see, if he if he admitted him at 11.55pm, that would mean he wasn't there when the murder happened. Uh, um... Betty Williams, assistant at the club, said he arrived between 12.30 and 12.40 a.m., 20 minutes after the shooting. Uh, she identified him as the man who entered the club at 12.40 a.m. Uh, Mr. Mark looked into the uh, billiard room at about 6 a.m. and found a small coloured man known as Jesus asleep on the chairs in front of the fire. We woke him, told him to go. He did. Um, he'd known him for about nine months. We knew him quite well. And the distance from where the shooting happened to 5 Gerrard Street is roughly around 25 minutes if you if you walked it. So it's all doable. So it's it's, conv- it's it, it makes sense that he would have done the shooting, then he would have ran down to a place that he knows. So that, so that all fits together. Um, let's... Uh, Alice Shepherd and Herman, their statements. Uh, Alice said, I turned towards St Pancras Church. So that's on the opposite side of the road if you've ever been to euston station you've come out of euston station if you look left you will see the fire station that's still there and then just down from that is uh the elizabeth anderson hospital that's next door to that and then immediately next door to that would have been the cabinet uh, the coffin makers and the coffee shops so that's right there and immediately opposite that is st pancras church um she said, I then turned towards St Pancras Church. I saw a civilian running towards Eversholt Street. He was coming from the direction of the coffee stall. Uh, so this is after the shooting. Uh, but on the opposite side of the road, he passed very close to me on the corner of Eversholt and Euston Road. As the lights were on, I got a very good view of him. He was short and dressed in a dark overcoat and a trilby hat down in front. I knew this man as Jesus, as he'd pestered me on several occasions. And he was known to women I know who told me his name. Uh, she said she heard the shots uh, as she got to the corner of Upper Woburn Place and Euston Road, having just said goodbye to Herman. Uh, and Jesus ran past her by the fire station. He was running very fast. Herman said, the woman walked with me as far as the corner of Upper Woburn Place, uh, where she said goodnight. <coughs> That's nice of her. She's walked him home. <laughs> um and and <coughs> well fresh that's lovely and then i went to the liberty club i did not hear any shots fired this is important during the time i was at the coffee stall i did not see any any colored male civilians so um if um if philip berry said that he was there he would have recognized him but he said everyone there was white uh and nobody intervened to take my side so fred white when you say uh, that you uh, intervened um apparently they say that you didn't uh, this was his first trip trip to london no one knew him and he was due back on camp in taunton the next day um a little bit about the murder in there let's dive into some of the stuff that f- uh fred said because uh, don't forget philip didn't give a statement he even though he gave a few statements to his prior conviction for mary miller's attempted murder i.e gbh uh, he didn't with this one he you know it's it's you're right you can make the decision not to do that so he he gave nothing uh fred said the next thing i remember is that a small colored man a civilian ran into me and gave me a push which knocked me off my balance saying get out of my way when the small negro pushed me i stumbled backwards to the edge of the pavement the small negro was standing about two feet on my right just but just off the curb 
the Dutchman was still standing by the wall of 151 Euston Road. That is, uh, that's where the uh, the coffin makers was. Uh, Berry, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, oh, the gun, uh, the gun, 45 caliber revolver, not found. N no idea where it is, and there were no because it was a revolver. Um, uh, no empty uh, shell casings were found at the scene. Uh, although Mary Miller confirmed that Berry was in possession of a similar firearm. Um, the shooting, uh, this is Fred again, he said, I saw a small Negro draw a revolver from his right pocket. Uh, this, he pointed at the Dutchman and fired four shots. As the Negro fired four uh, shots, Berry apparently shouted, you couldn't kill me, buddy. It's interesting. I, I couldn't find anyone else who'd, uh, who can verify that source. Um, Fred said the Dutchman fell downwards to the ground. Jan staggered backwards against the wall and fell. Uh, Gerrit ran as did the others. Now, this is the bit I like about I didn't put this in the episode, but this is what Fred said. When the Negro was firing, I lifted my right foot with the intention of trying to kick the revolver out of his hand. He then fired at me, uh, and the flame, i.e. the muzzle, appeared to pass in front of my body. The small Negro was standing underneath the lamp, and I could see him perfectly. He does that a couple of times. I mean, it could be true. It could be true uh, that he um, he dived on them. Um, he tr broke them up and he was almost shot at, but he could just be bullshit. So let's do the quiz questions and then I will go and urinate. Oh, exciting. <coughs> and then I'll go to the coffee shop and start doing oh, burpees, the first edit on this. So there we go. Question number one. London wasn't... Oh, That's question number one. Question number one. Uh, London wasn't in a blackout, but what was it in? It was in a dim out. Question number two. What hotel was Garrett staying at? It was the Osborne Hotel. Question number three. What jobs did Jan and Garrett do? They were merchant seamen. Question number four. What pub did they go to first? Uh, it was the Rising Sun, which is still there today, just just down from there, and is now called the Rocket. Question number five: How many pints do we know that Jan that Jan had drank? Uh, at least eight pints of beer. Legend. Question number six: uh, What did Alice and Herman have at the coffee stall? They had tea and cake. Of course they did, because they're civilized. They're decent people. Uh, question number seven. Ooh, little fart there. Question number seven. Uh, Herman was staying at what hotel and club? It was the Liberty Club. Oh, no. This isn't going to become the episode where people go, oh, I like the bit where you fart. Oh, no. Please don't let it become the fart episode. It is, isn't it? All my hard work, and it's going to become the fart. Oh, the fart. Oh, the fart was funny. What about the rest of the episode? Yeah, the fart was funny. Oh, no. Uh, question number eight. Uh, in what city was Philip Berry born? Uh, supposedly Lagos, uh, but he also lived in Freetown in Sierra Leone. Question number nine. Uh, his nickname amongst prostitutes was what? Jesus. Uh, and question number ten. Why? It was said that he quoted scripture while having sex. Well, there we go. There we go. It takes all sorts, doesn't it? Thanks, all sorts. Uh, so that's me done, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, episode, oh, what was that? 248. There you go, 248 episodes. Almost, almost entirely original episodes full of details that you can't get anywhere else. There you go. I'm only saying that because I was talking to a, a, a podcaster, a very well-known podcaster this week, and their episode took them three hours to do. Three hours. That's three hours of research and writing and recording. Oh, why do that? Why 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 not put in the effort for the audience? Why not put in the effort? And this is a really, really successful podcast. And they just didn't want to do it, couldn't be asked. And I even said, Are you happy with the episode? And they went, nah, it's shit. But it's fine. I just can't I can't do that. I did say to them, I've spent the I'm on day six of research in this case now. Day six. 
oh anyway anyway i'm going to continue doing what i want to do which is researching really hard and making these the best episodes i can and making them really nice for you because i don't think i don't think i could do that i don't think i could do a shit piece together do it in one evening and bang it out kind of shite i can't do that i'm sorry i can't do it anyway that's me done uh let i'm gonna go to the coffee shop and see if i've been paid for my money where's my money so anyway i'll catch you all soon folks thank you for supporting the show it's very much appreciated have yourself a good one stay safe and be good lots of love